It's House of Strauss. We are joined by Neil Payne of the Neil Payne Substack. I was going to try to say, I, I realized that I did not know how to say the word for named after yourself, though I have read it many times. I didn't want to take the risk of just begetting this and going, Apodium Yeah, whatever that I think is. Neil's got it. Eponymous. Eponymous. There we go. Yes. There we go. What an indictment of my perspicacity or pronunciation. Anywho, uh, man, you're really good. I, I oh, feel like you. I should have known this. I feel like I should have known this. It's one of these things where you're not exposed to what everybody's doing. And we've been in, we've been at sort of the same place or similar shops and I've been aware of your work. But what's great about Substack is you can really give yourself a showcase of what you do and how you think. And I've really enjoyed your Substack because you just find these little things that don't totally add up to the standard pattern and it's fun to explore and sometimes it's a bit of a mystery that remains a mystery and sometimes it's a mystery that is given an explanation but yeah neil you are a sports omnivore i mean are you just into all of these things how yeah. do you keep track of all these sports uh well first of all thanks for having me on the show and uh it's, it kind of goes both ways because i feel like you're you're someone that i feel like i did know or should have known or it's one of those things where it's like how do i not know uh this person in uh some sort of like official capacity so really excited to be on the show and in terms of all the sports i mean you know i think like a lot of us grew up watching you know sports center uh, back in its glory days and all of the different you know, world's strongest man, even like uh, just ESPN mm. used to used to have like just every sport. And I was a kid that couldn't get enough of it. I would spend, you know, during the summer, I would spend like hours outside, you know, playing baseball. Uh, if I had somebody to play with, if I didn't, I would make up my own sports. And then at night I would like watch whatever was on ESPN. And so that kind of carried with me. And for me, it's also about like, if I can get a data set, because I'm one of those analytic wonk uh, nerd folk. Mm. And uh, so if I can get data on a particular sport, for some reason that just like really excites me about covering it, uh, whether it's, you know, NASCAR, that's a sport that uh, I have created stats on that a lot of people are surprised. You can even have stats for, uh, mm. you know, the WNBA, uh, obviously, you know, the, the core kind of men's pro leagues and everything. But uh, if I can get data on it and if I feel like I can kind of get a grasp on how that relates to meaningful things about the sport, that to me is just catnip and I just want to run with it. Yeah, the WNBA is an interesting one for you because as you've indicated in writing about it, there is such emotionality really revolving around Caitlin Clark, who ironically is not, self-presenting as anybody controversial and you're one of the people whose analysis i just trust is not being infected by that particular conversation and when you come up with analysis that runs contra to my subjective take of what i'm watching i go oh that's interesting and i know there's no there's no angle here when you're talking about the statistical models not being all that positive about Clark and not agreeing that she should be on the Olympic team. It's nice to be able to come to a place and go, OK, this is a place where I know that that is a perspective that it might be right or wrong, but it's not it's not part of this other thing that seems to derange people and make them see things that aren't there or make them not see things that are there. Yeah, and that was kind of the perspective. I wrote a thing about why the advanced metrics were maybe not as high on Caitlin Clark as we would expect. And she has actually gone up. I wrote a thing, you know, I, I do freelance work for ESPN and they wanted a rookie ranking of the WNBA rookie class because it's a very historically uh, star powered class. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I expected and fully, you know, not, I'm not going to say I wanted, but like, I, I really was rooting for Caitlin Clark to be, you know, very high on the list. And then deadline comes around for the first uh, edition of this column. She is, I think, sixth, which is, you know, I, a lot of people had a problem with that. And I think from a subjective standpoint, I totally understand that, especially given, like you mentioned, the emotions around it, just the eye test of watching her play. She's extremely exciting to watch. And 
So I, I did that, uh, and it was just purely based on the metrics. And she has actually risen, although she is behind Angel Reese right now. I'm, I'm preparing the second version of it. And, of course, both of them are, you know, they're playing a lot better than they were a month ago. Uh, and they're both going in kind of different ways of doing it as well. Like Angel Reese has this historic double-double streak that she's putting up. She's kind of putting up numbers in the box score. Caitlin Clark, of course, you know, is also putting up numbers. And I think there's a really interesting, like if you could put aside, uh, and I got a lot of blowback from where I ranked Caitlin Clark the first time around, put aside the idea of, there's a lot of things to unpack in there of like, okay, it was only like three weeks into the season. We said we would be updating it. Uh, there's a difference between backwards looking value and forward looking projection, all of that stuff. But also one of the things I did in my subsequent piece where I was sort of looking at like, why don't these stats like Caitlin Clark as much as you would expect? There is a really demonstrable effect where guards, even really highly touted guards. So we're talking about Sabrina Ionescu, uh, you know, all, all of these generational guards that have come out in recent years, they take a while to show up as being really valuable players in the WNBA compared with bigs like an Aaliyah Boston, who had really good numbers last year. Her numbers have kind of puzzlingly or maybe not mm. so puzzlingly fallen off a little bit uh, playing with Caitlin Clark because I think she's a unique player to even fit other players around and they have to change to, to accommodate her style. But there is just this effect where the learning curve seems to be much higher. If you're a perimeter player in the WNBA versus uh, a big or someone who plays inside. And that's an insight that you actually couldn't get if you were wrapped up in some of the hype yeah. around things. And, and you were just looking at it of like, she's shooting these logo threes. It's amazing. And I'm like, I agree, but there's other factors in there, whether it's, you know, looking at the turnovers, looking at the on versus off uh, effect on her team. Uh, and so there's, there's many different facets that you can unpack. And I like that. I like the, the fact that you can say, well, she looks really good in this one thing, but less good in this other thing. But then there's this maybe a uh, factor that's not being accounted for in the stats. And, and that's, I think, really exciting about breaking things down with analytics yeah I'll, I'll give you i'll give you one that you talked about that it's just interesting to think about i know some of the people are listening right now and maybe they don't want to hear about WNBA because frankly it, the players aren't as good as the nba you just they don't say that on espn but everybody everybody in real life understands that i don't take that understanding and then go oh i hate this product i like the roger ebert it's not what a movie is, but how it is about it. Whatever I'm enjoying sports wise, I can find something in there to puzzle over and think about. And in this case, some of the differences in quality actually, I think, create some new questions. One of them regarding Clark is this. She's got this crazy high turnover rate. And when you watch her play, and as some of her defenders have noted in these highlights, a lot of the passes are dead on passes that just hit players in the hands and peter on out of bounds. And some of these are these full court passes. And so my instinct is to go, well, these turnovers aren't her fault. But then I think another level beyond that, and I go, well, wait a second, though. If these passes that I would expect to be caught are so regularly not caught, then at that point, are these poor plays to make? And in a way, they are her fault. And it suggests that she should be jacking more threes or scoring more because look maybe you would want these teammates to catch these passes and they would be expected to do so in the basketball i normally watch but if they're not then they're not and i have no guarantee that they're going to start doing it so then what does that mean neil yeah that's a really good question because uh, it gets back to that thing that i sort of mentioned uh, for a split second about this idea of backwards looking value versus sort of projecting talent going forward or sort of in a neutral environment of you know the turnovers happened they they cost the team possessions like if you're accounting for things looking backwards you can try to split those up uh, between the person that made the pass versus not. She actually leads the WNBA in bad pass turnovers, which is a category that they actually track. You can go to basketball reference and look at that uh, by like a wide margin over the second ranked player. So I think a little bit of that is like, 
overstated perhaps of the the players mm. with the hands of the teammates with the hands of stone letting them sort of like bounce off which i've seen you know a, a great number of times as well it's clearly both she is a lot oh yeah it's both <laughs> right i mean lot. if you're passing <laughs> as much as she is uh, and that's something that i want to talk about in a second as well but uh there there is this idea of like okay how much value was lost through the turnovers to the team to this point in the season versus Okay, if you have players that are becoming more accustomed to playing with her, and they're NBA players, like especially players that played with Magic Johnson, I think about, I, f- I forget about who exactly said this, but this idea of like, okay, when he has the ball, you, no matter where you are on the court, have your hands up, be ready. You yeah. have to be ready because your normal basketball IQ of like, okay, I'm in a place where I can't possibly receive a pass and nobody's going to even think to give me a pass. It just doesn't apply when you have a player of that ability. And you see that a little bit with like, Nikola Jokic is somebody like that as well, where I think it's just a recalibration and that takes time when you've been playing with, for lack of a better term, like normal players for a long time. And then you have this player that is like just totally redefining, you know, different aspects of the game. And so I think if you're projecting going forward, you would think those would would be reduced and that you would get a truer sense of how much the turnovers and the assist to turnover ratio really reflects her ability as a passer. But then also one of the things I noted in my Substack piece about her was there's this concept, which I think it was Seth Partno, who's with the athletic uh, coin, which is heliocentrism, which I'm sure you've heard uh, many times as an NBA oh, this, beat reporter. I, I, th- I am <laughs> fascinated. I said this on a podcast with Jesse Single that that this is caught on. And I credit Seth for making Fetch happen. I am never able to make Fetch happen. And I'm just how did such a tricky erudite term catch to this degree this heliocentricity but yes can continue continue oh, well, you just have you know so many fans of nicholas copernicus out there that it just really I kind about of latched that. on yeah i forgot uh, but, about that but no i made the case that uh caitlin clark is almost like I don't know if she's the first heliocentric WNBA player, but she is like kind of the most heliocentric player in the league right now in a way that like she has a really high usage rate, which is the share of like shooting possessions that you use when you're on the court. There's a lot of scorers in the WNBA, so she's not number one in that. But the combination of her assist rate as well with the usage rate, nobody else in the league has that combination of those two metrics. And that's like you know, a James Harden or, you know, some of these guys in the NBA uh, as they progressed into this era of like, let's just have one guy. He's going to run high pick and roll. He's going to mm. isolate. He's going to cook. Basically, you didn't really have that in the WNBA as much in the past. And so there is also this sense that like Caitlin Clark is playing a different style fundamentally than we've seen from like most players in the history of the WNBA, because the WNBA is a lot more of a big oriented sport, like an interior oriented sport. And that's why I think, you know, Asia Wilson was kind of complaining. I know you've talked about this on the podcast, but a lot of the noise around like, well, why is Caitlin Clark getting a shoe deal? And Asia Wilson, you know, set the all time WNBA single game scoring record and is this multi-time champion leader of this like dynasty with the aces. She's not getting the same level of attention. And I know there's like, a lot going on in there to unpack and uh you know that it would take the whole podcast to do that but i think a little bit of that is that like asia wilson plays just fundamentally more of sort of an interior game it's it's aesthetic yeah it's aesthetic exactly exactly logo threes or something we haven't seen as much or maybe ever Yeah, for whatever reason as human beings somebody hitting a bunch of 12 foot bank shots at a rate of i'm not even saying this is how she plays i'm saying this hypothetically if tim duncan was even was more efficient tim duncan. <laughs> yeah and tim duncan's kind of a weird case because in a well, way he was he's off- underrated a lot of people don't appreciate his career as much as they should probably you know he had this nickname about being mr fundamental but like he was really fundamental and it played in sort of a style that maybe didn't catch people's attention as much as a michael jordan or oh. a kobe or a lebron I would say he's underrated, but he's underrated. He is underrated defensively and perhaps overrated offensively is what I would say about Duncan. Um, Efficiency wise, he was not at the level you would think for an all time great big when it came to his offense. Some of that was the era. It wasn't a particularly efficient era that he played in. 
Um, obviously, he was a willing passer and a perceptive passer, so I'm not saying this totally encompasses who he was, but I think he's got a fair argument as the best defensive player of his era, and he wasn't rewarded that way. And a lot of that was because he didn't have the especially gaudy block totals, but he would blow up the other team's plays and his team would consistently rank out those Spurs as the best defensive team. And for whatever reason, and this is a dead horse I've beaten quite a bit, we just don't in the manner that we might not regard whatever Asia Wilson is doing uh, as more exciting. We don't regard defense as captivating as offense and you see echoes of that even today with all the resources we have of well clay thompson was perhaps angry because he's so great and draymond was getting the commitment from the team and i go draymond was better than clay he was just better it's just we don't think about it that way because clay saving the warriors ass with 41 points against the thunder is a more captivating, tangible thing to us than whatever comparable Draymond defensive performance has happened. And now I'm rambling. I apologize, Neil. No, I I, I think this is all super interesting because I've thought about this a lot too. Like what even would the defensive equivalent of like 37 points in a quarter be like, you know, a bunch of chase down blocks or whatever? (laughs) A bunch of anticipated. I mean, that's the thing. It's hard to describe. I remember the Warriors... The Warriors loved opening up their games under Mark Jackson with a set called Motion Week, which was a very popular NBA set. And it was actually popularized by the San Antonio Spurs. But by the time the Warriors were doing it, this wasn't the new hotness. This wasn't blowing anybody's minds. It had run through the league for a while. And who would know it better than the Spurs? And I remember them opening up the game against the Spurs and Tim Duncan with Motion Week. And I think they would do it to just, it was this very old school Mark Jackson sense of let's get the bigs involved as there's a little cross screen and the big gets it on the block by the end of it. And I saw Duncan just sleepily almost like he was annoyed at having to do it, blow up the action. He just kind of walked over to where the cross screen was going and just messed it up. And there's just nothing in the box score for that. That's just, you know, one's awareness. The Warriors had to throw the ball back out and they just kind of were scrambled and that's what it was. And so, yeah, you can't, there's no 37 point in the quarter equivalent for this abstract prevention of a thing. That's just not, that's just not there. Yeah, well, Ethan, by the way, we we better watch out. I think this is turning into a J.J. Reddick podcast. We're breaking down the X's oh, and O's. Let me of- get my wine. Where's where's my wine right here? The other the, people don't know. We know. You, you yeah, and I know. We're, we're very we're smart. We're the true basketball the experts. The fan, the, the knuckle-dragging idiot fan, and it just disgusts me that we even have to talk in a way that they can understand sometimes because we're just on this other level. But what are you going to do? Sometimes you just got to deign do such a thing. I, look, um, Um, there's just a lot. There are a lot of little mysteries in sports. And sometimes on this podcast and in my writing, we talk about the cultural aspects, but sports themselves, I find to be interesting because they are man-made constructs that we, though we invented them, don't completely understand. That to me is very odd and fun. And I just keep returning to it. And I'm endlessly fascinated by why things are and and what they are. And I think your Substack scratches that particular itch. It's why I like to pick your brain on I mean, we could take this in a variety of directions. Let's go let's go NFL right here. We'll just start we'll just start speed running things. I've got Ron work- Purdy's PFR page open. So Oh, oh, okay. Well now now I'm excited. I mean uh, maybe some of the people listening are groaning about Purdy Muse of twenty twenty three. But I I am engaged. Well okay. We're hitting all Purdy's the muses, in- I think. All the muses, Caitlin Clark, Brock Purdy. Um, Purdy has been an entry point into a general theory that I'm flirting with. I don't know if I'm totally there, but I'm flirting with this theory, and I want your perspective on it. My theory is that the production of NFL players is underrated as just a reflection of how good they are and that you are who you are. Obviously, I understand that there are so many variables in football, so many moving parts, different coaches, different schemes, different teammates. It's a 53-man roster. But in a weird way, I think it's led to this circumstance where 
football analysts are overrating what they see and their perception beforehand and their confirmation bias is getting in the way and the data is probably a better reflection is it the best reflection when it comes to purdy and him just being at the top of these stats that's a different conversation it's just the whole purdy phenomenon has illuminated that aspect to me and i've made the observation that quarterbacks especially you would think that they're very situation dependent but they're actually weirdly situation stable it's once a decade that we get a Geno Smith or a Rich Gann and we get a quarterback in a new situation that becomes dramatically better. That's once a decade. My theory behind this, Neil, and perhaps you disagree, but my ex explanatory theory for the initial observation is this. Football is so competitive and the coaches are all spending 100-hour weeks. They're all copying each other that the differences in scheme and players are actually smaller than what we might think. And that is why whatever you're doing in many instances is just how good you are. That's the theory, Neil. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, that makes me think of uh, there's this concept called the paradox of skill, where basically if the everyone is operating at like, say, the 99th percentile or 99th point ninth percentile, uh, which I think, you know, as much money and as much effort as is poured mm. into the NFL they, they, you have to assume that they are even as much as we like to criticize coaching decisions and things like that. But, you know, when everything is compressed skill wise that much, any differences are due to external factors. A lot of times that might be luck that, you know, the differences yeah. kind of in luck are magnified, but it could also be in the sense of like, okay, you've maxed out the, the coaching preparation that you can do. And so differences are explained by things like you were saying, like, things that we didn't see in a Brock Purdy or someone like that. And I, I think your point is really well taken about the so much of analysis of the NFL is through this kind of coaching lens. And the famously coaches think that, well, if the players had just executed their roles on, on a, this play, we would have scored a touchdown on every play. Every coach believes that I forget which coach said that, whether it was like bear Bryant or something like that, but they mm. truly feel like, if everyone just followed their plan, everything would be successful. And I think uh, that filters down into this idea of like, well, we couldn't have been wrong about Brock Purdy and had him mm. be Mr. Irrelevant. It has to be the scheme. It has to be Kyle Shanahan. It has to be, you know, these factors that yeah. are kind of elevating lesser talents or people being held back. We don't often hear as much about that, of the opposite of it, but it has to be true. If you believe that there are players who are kind of held back by their scheme uh, and, and all of that, but like you alluded to, there's a lot of quarterback metrics that are pretty stable when quarterbacks change teams, for instance. So sack rate is the one that I always go to for the longest time. And I think a lot of people still do this. They attribute sack rate to the offensive line uh, and to just generally the conditions of the player on the specific team that he's on. But if you look at the history of quarterbacks, when they change teams or they have different personnel around them, sack rate stays pretty stable and things like air yards per pass. That's another one that really stays stable uh, where if you're a deep passer, maybe it's just that teams tend to use you in a way that they've seen you be used before, but there's probably mm. also something inherent. And then to go back to the luck factor interception rate is something that we put a lot of attention yes. on because turnovers determine more often than not, they really determine who wins or loses a game. You could look at who has fewer turnovers and I forget what the exact number is, but like it's a really high winning percentage for the team that wins the turnover battle. And yet interception rate is wildly inconsistent between seasons. And uh, when a player changes teams, he will be likely to, it would change his interception profile in a way that maybe we don't fully appreciate. Well, yeah, and that should inform your sense of what will happen in the next season. CJ Stroud, for instance, Stroud could improve as a quarterback next season, and his numbers might look yeah. way worse because his interception rate was just comically low as a rookie. 
And I, are you are you pulling that up? I do want. This I was looking at his. Uh, yeah, while you were saying that, I was looking because he did yeah. lead the league in lowest interception rate. And to me, yeah, that's like you know, it's not a red flag because his other numbers were so good as well. But that part will probably regress. The one guy that it uh, didn't really regress that much for, which is I think an underappreciated aspect of what made him the goat, is Tom Brady. Tom Brady mm. was one of the biggest reasons why the Patriots dynasty had always had one of the best turnover margins in the league is because he had so fewer giveaways just by himself than uh, pretty much every other quarterback. And I feel like there's so much of Brady's greatness that is still uh, like we, we, there's a mystery to it. We don't fully understand. We saw it happen. And all of us, you know, are, are, uh, it's so recent that we have memories of it still, even the very beginning of it. And yet, we, we still can't fully explain why he was so great. But factors like that are kind of hidden reasons why he was the GOAT. Yeah. His, if we talk about highlight clips, you don't see many Brady highlight clips that would astound you. And watching Peyton Manning felt more like a wow. And he was just in control of everything, which maybe was to his detriment. I, I saw someone quite analytically minded on Twitter arguing that his defense let him down and it's unfair that he was called a playoff choker and somebody else, I think kind of a Niners blogger agreeing and saying a guy going to the Super Bowl four times. But I would say as having lived it, I I do kind of think that Peyton Manning, at least for a time was a playoff choker. I do think he got overwhelmed. I do think that he suffered from an inability to delegate um, that can compromise overall efficiency when there's more stress placed on a performer. That's just how I, that's just how I see it. And I would say that the stats do back that one up. Uh, but now I'm getting completely digressive with all of this. Uh, Tom Brady. Yes. It's hard just in the way it is with the seeing the blowing up the motion week. It's hard to see the avoidance of a mistake. And that's one of the reasons I'm very excited for Brady as an announcer, because it's almost like we are going to unpack the mystery of what made him great potentially just in his commentary. Perhaps that's too ambitious a statement to make, but every interview he does about why he did what he did feels like that. And so it's going to be just so it's such an unusual circumstance. I think Neil, and it's a good observation by you to have not understood, not understood what made somebody great at the time, but recognize their accomplishments as great and then later on through their words, get a sense of it. I think that's happening. Yeah. And the history of great quarterbacks as announcers is really interesting to me because we had Joe Montana, who was Brady's idol and was sort of the consensus goat until Brady came along, famously was terrible. You know, no offense mm. to him, <laughs> but, uh, he, you know, he lasted, I want to say maybe like one season as an announcer and then kind of realized it wasn't for him. Uh, but then you have, you know, Tony Romo. I know the shine has come off him a little bit, but uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, he has had certainly a, a better career as an announcer than maybe we would expect from. And you can also quibble whether he was truly a great quarterback. Statistically, he was pretty good. You know, he was yeah. better than uh, the, than the the norm for for quite a while. So I do think it is really just fascinating to see whether what's inside of the brain translates through the medium of broadcasting uh, because we've seen other times it didn't work and that's true across all sports it's it's like the old thing where you know Michael Jordan couldn't articulate what made him great enough to even mm. be able to motivate anyone uh, in his post playing career or uh, be able to you know, pick uh, talented players for his teams. Even there's something maybe sometimes that just doesn't translate because it's ineffable. You it's just confined to that one person. Yeah. But I think being a quarterback is a little bit different. It's almost a management position versus being a great basketball player. Um, But yeah, I think we've perhaps underrated 
aspects of Brady or the smart analytical people would want to tout these other people because they want to sort of jump ahead to explaining why Brady is like a Derek Jeter figure who has been blessed by circumstance. Uh, and well, we've already crowned Mahomes, right? You know, I thought the funniest mm-hmm. thing was after the Super Bowl, all of this talk about like, is Mahomes the goat? Uh, and it's like, okay, calm down. We literally just saw a guy <laughs> set a record for the most Super Bowls won in his career and won one at whatever it was, 43 or whatever, however world he was with a different team like let's give it a little time you know nothing against uh, Mahomes. i do love that the swings and the stakes are that high though and the overreaction is that high where oh if, if nick bosa again Mays and i are both uh we we're both racked in pain thinking about what might have been if nick bosa doesn't get tricked by the quarterback keeper then we have a totally different <laughs> totally different narrative and i i love that stuff with stafford who is uh, Stafford's awesome, but it, if uh, again, it all revolves around the Niners trust. But if Tart <laughs> doesn't drop that interception that was gifted to him, we have a totally different narrative yeah. on Stafford potentially. But let's uh, let's stay in this whole NFL and the perhaps the NFL is interesting to me because it's almost like it has not been money balled, and perhaps it could be. But the people who talk about it and discuss it are usually not analytically inclined uh there are more uh people who observe a lot like baseball scouts and there's a value to it can we get into why the nfl draft is unbeatable why can't you beat the nfl draft well i think some of it goes back to the paradox of skill uh like we were talking about earlier where people devote every team devotes just maximum resources to the scouting process and you've kind of maxed out exactly how much you can really judge before a guy actually comes into the league. Otherwise th- there's just so many moving parts. And I think that goes to why it hasn't been money balled fully. I loved your conversation by the way, with Freddie DeBoer in the, in a previous podcast, I think it was either mm-hmm. earlier this week or last week talking about basically the undertone of that was like, the money balling of sports has ruined them, which I totally mm. agree with on a certain mm. level, but certainly it varies by sport and football is probably the sport that's been least done to death that way. And, and mm. certainly there are um, like, inspirations you can take from the numbers for best practices we're seeing teams go for it on fourth down more. We're seeing teams uh, just be more smart about plus expected value play calling and decision making. I don't know that that has really kind of translated though, as much to something like the draft. And, and we just see so often that we'll, we'll have all this hype about a historic quarterback class with like three or four can't miss guys. And then of course, like all of those guys will miss and then we'll memory hole it. And then like two years later, we'll do the exact same thing again. And if anybody, nobody is like pumping the brakes and being like, didn't you guys just tell us that (laughs) these guys, you know, uh, Josh Rosen and, uh, you know, (laughs) whatever that, I mean, that class was really a a mixed bag. Like the best players from that class were like Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, and they were not the the top quarterbacks picked. So yeah, there's some of that. And then there's also, of course, like the egos involved of the, the, general managers and the scouts that they just desperately want to be able to say that they have insight into who is going to be the best. And and they don't want to admit that there's a lot of uncertainty, even if you're the best at this, it's okay to not be able to project quarterbacks coming out of college. Yeah. They do all this analysis and it just turns out that trading down overall works because you just don't, these teams, they don't actually tend to know what they're looking at and having more picks is better, more bites at the apple. And that's just, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that it is that difficult. And I want to get into the mysteries of the draft and get into the NBA a little bit, but I think football is so weird to me just because I'm used to some of the intense analysis done in the NBA and obviously baseball, which you read a lot about has that, And football, the way quarterbacks are described, feels like something from the 1970s, where it's just common to go, well, here are the yards, completion percentage, touchdown interception. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, in these top line sacks, Freudian slip, sacks, where are the sacks? Where are the fumbles? I mean, these things really matter. I, I see Trevor Lawrence is being debated. 
he just got a lot of money. And I'm not, I'm not saying that Trevor Lawrence can't become what people thought that he would become. I'm not saying I'm not closing the door on it, but I see so many conversations about him that do not bring up 33 fumbles and 50 starts. I mean, that is, if he's, unless he stops doing that, it, it won't happen. And th- it's, it's odd to me that the sort of, what am I trying to explain here? We've got this way stats have been conveyed. And if you go on football reference, it shows you that top line of the quarterbacks. And I still feel like that has the power to inordinately focus the conversation of the value of the position that is the most obsessed over position in American sports. Well, and think about broadcasts because in other sports broadcasts, we're starting to see, you know, I remember it was a big deal when ESPN started showing like OPS in the lower third when a go, when a batter came up uh, to oh, the don't plate. Don't rile up Mike, don't rile up Wilbon. I mean, right, exactly. It was like, what are, you know, what are these nerds doing? And they're ruining my sports, but You've seen that you've seen, you know, like win probability is making its way onto ESPN broadcast, which you could debate whether that actually adds to the broadcast. If you know that a team has very little chance of coming back, but that's another conversation uh, on <laughs> hockey, like you know. Yeah, I have my mixed feelings about it as well. Uh, on I, hockey, I you see I, like zone time. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I know. I just, I'm going to get on my Michael Wilbon. I don't like catch probability in the yeah, MLB. Yeah, catch probability. Yeah. I hate that. I hate that. I mean, look, maybe if we look back at it, but they show the stat cast and they show some amazing play and they go, that was a 30% catch probability. And I go, well, that doesn't feel that exciting. And if you gave me a 1%, then I would be really ecstatic about it. But also, I don't know if you actually know that. Maybe you have some sort of analysis that tells you it's in the ballpark, so to speak. But yeah, I don't want to hear that something that amazed me was a 33% (laughs) chance of happening. That's the same odds that you would give Tony Gwynn of getting a hit. That's not that's not so great, but that's what you see repeatedly. Yeah, maybe the threshold needs to be lower than like one out of every three times (laughs) we would expect a guy to do it. Now, I do think, you know, the um, that all comes out of the positioning data, the through st- the radar tracking and stat cast. And one of the other cool things that they can actually do with that is they can show the path that the player took to the ball along the, the outfield and trace it and then compare it to like, what if he had just taken like a straight line to where the mm. ball ended up being and calculate what was the optimization of his his route and things like that? So, or what was the speed of his first, how much of that catch was due to his first step, like the reaction of the bat off the ball versus just the speed enable uh, enabling him to just chase it down. That to me is cool. And graphically, you can kind of represent that oh. and gives you more than just saying like, okay, it was an improbable catch. Now, of course, if I, we had that for like Willie Mays catch in, uh, you know, 1954, <laughs> that would be amazing. I would like to know like exactly, was it one in a thousand? Would, was it, you know, whatever. I, I, I would, but how disappointed would you be if in the if it was thirty percent, <laughs> yeah. If it was, hey man, that Willie Mays basket catch in center field was about a twenty five percent probability. He took like a weird route to it. It was about yeah, it 25%. wasn't optimal. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. But I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by how do they know where the ball is going? What is that skill to know where it's heading and to get a good jump on it? Baseball is good for all those all all those sorts of questions. I do want to still return to the draft and pivot from NFL to NBA, you wrote something that I've thought about for years, which is, do we really know that a weak draft is weak? Because I feel as though I have often heard all of this weak draft, weak draft. Oh, you've got a pick, but it's in a weak draft. And then the draft turns out to be very strong. I was at the 2009 draft. That was thought to be a weak draft. Um, Take my word from uh, for it, people. Don't 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 research it. But I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that was considered to be a weak draft. And what do you know? After Blake Griffin, you've got James Harden, you've got Steph Curry, the immortal Johnny Flynn. Just kidding. But you've got a lot of you've got some serious talent there. And I, it just seems like we don't actually know. It's similar to the NFL theme and not being able to beat the NFL draft. It. it we're talking about something else. When we talk about weak draft. I think we're often talking about that. We don't know who's going to be great as opposed to there being a dearth of greatness. What's your interpretation after having written about this? When I looked at it, I did find that 
probably the most predictive thing about whether draft would be weak or not was just the quality of the top prospect. You don't have to actually mm. care about the rest of the prospects. Uh, if, if there's a guy who's rated really high, and I used, uh, God, what NBA draft.net, which is a site that I remember using back in like the mid 2000s, but they still have, they have a lot of archived uh, scouting reports nice. for players, uh, which made it useful for me. Uh, no, vouching otherwise for whether they're you know the, the top of the line or not are they chad ford level are they uh, i don't even know who else but anyway uh so that number one prospect really gives you a sense of whether the draft is going to end up being weak or strong and that resonated with me because oftentimes and this was a good example of it this year We didn't really fully know who the number one pick was going to be, certainly not like a month or two before the draft. I think it really kind of narrowed down to the two French guys at the very end. And and you kind of look at that. But it wasn't like a Wimby, like we know three years out or whatever it is that, you know, this guy is going to be the number one pick. And there have been other ones. LeBron is famously like he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated when he was like 16. And, you know, Okay, we're gonna we're gonna circle this draft on our calendar and optimize around getting a high pick that year and try to get him. But it really does vary. And I was gonna say, you know, you remembered the 2009 draft. I the first draft that I did uh, like preparation for as a consultant for the Hawks was the Anthony Bennett draft, which oh, yeah. is just such a time capsule of. I, I think nobody even knew. That on the night of the draft, who was going to be the number one pick? And there's a clip of Bill Simmons when they announced that uh, the Bennett is the number one pick. He just ma- like the camera was on him. He didn't know that he was necessarily being uh, filmed, and he was just like, "Whoa!" Uh, and, <laughs> and and everybody's reaction was like, I think some people were trying to kind of justify it and be like, "Oh, this kid can really shoot," and I'm not really worried about the. Uh, the conditioning and then you have other people that are like this guy i don't know i'm not sure i'm not sure about him at number one his college stats were really pretty good from what i remember i'm pulling them up a freshman at unlv uh 16 points on 10.8 shots uh 1.2 1.2 blocks, 0.7 steals, so the block steal rate not terrible. What worries you is that one assist a game and, uh, you know, eight rebounds. But he played 27 minutes. You could talk yourself into it and say he was hyper-efficient. But and the Cavs that, did. And they did. Well, that era was kind of strange. There was this era around that time where power forwards were overdrafted and would bust. Your Derek Williams is, uh, yeah. as it were. And... Eventually, power forward became more of a shooty kind of position and more of a perimeter position, and it seemed like we got better at predicting that. 2011 draft you brought up, that was another one that was thought to be weak, and then you just look at how much strength was in it. If you just pick a guy with a K name, you were coming out pretty pretty good there. Uh, Kyrie at number one, Kawhi, Clay, Kemba, the Ks, yeah. and then... Uh, you know, Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler went first 30th runner. in that draft. Yeah. And he, and you've got another all-star and Isaiah Thomas way at the end, although, you know, a little up and down there. It's, it's hard to predict. We often think we know more than we do, which can be kind of fun. Uh, I think, but I think the NBA where it's easier than the NFL draft to predict and to understand, I do think sometimes we're a little too quick to say weak. We, we don't, we don't completely know. We just don't. And it's funny because I do think that's been one of the lessons out of all of analytics when they look at drafts. Uh, and I go back to a paper that was written by Cade Massey and Richard Thaler, uh, who are these academics that they looked at basically how overconfident GMs were in making their picks based on trades that they would make to trade up to take someone. And was that truly, was the market value for moving up from like fourth to third in the NFL draft or from Mm -hmm. second to first, was that truly paying dividends in terms of the performance of the players? And of course they found that no, uh, and they chalked it up on some level to overconfidence. And so the analytic lesson was uh, you talked about trading down. That's an aspect of it, of just like 
don't have so much confidence in yourself. But then we flip it around and uh, I go back to what Freddie was saying in the podcast the other day about the analytic nerd archetype of someone just sort of like shaking their head and just looking down on someone who's not doing the optimized analytic thing. And I think that's funny because it's like, okay, we're really ready to criticize uh, traditional, you know, sort of scouty types as being overconfident. And then we're going to get on our high horse. Maybe we should take a step back Mm. as well and look in the mirror about the things we don't know because we're always learning about things. And that's actually the cool thing about getting more data. And as we've seen, all these sports have exploded in the amount of data that they're tracking is we do learn some of the sacred cows that we thought were unassailable about analytics early on end up not being as true as we thought, or we have to add to them and, and adjust them some. Yes, uh, it's a refinement process in that way, or at least until we break the sport by over optimizing it, which is the topic that we were getting into a little bit. I want to, you know, speaking of guys who succeeded and should have been drafted higher in the NBA draft, I want to bring the conversation to a guy who is drafted in 2010 at the pick of number 10 and should have been picked number one. Because if we're talking about perhaps we should reassess our priors. I think this is a good place to go. There is a theme right now when it comes to Paul George of younger players and younger people thinking so much more of Paul George in his game than the current conventional wisdom thinks. And it's a bit of a mystery. And even though I've been someone to say that the young are often wrong about things and we shouldn't just accept that they are on to something that we older people aren't on to. Your writing about Paul George makes me wonder uh, if Paul George is as underrated as you are claiming him to be, perhaps the youth of America and the world are just understanding Paul George in a way he should be understood. Can you get into your thoughts of why Paul George is better than what people think and why this recent acquisition by the Sixers could be meaningful. Yeah, was it? Um, gosh, uh, whose podcast was it where like an active player was uh, said, I think he said like Paul George is my goat. And I think that set a lot of people off. First of all, the idea of like, okay, we each have our personal goats. It doesn't necessarily mean we think they're the number one that requires was an it adjustment. Car- was it Carmelo's kid? Maybe it might have been. It was, not, it, was, it was definitely younger. Brand- uh, Brandon Miller. Brandon Miller, I just looked up. It was, But there's, you know, the thing is, there are so many Zoomers and younger who have said this, that it could be a variety of people who said that. Paul yeah, George is so it, popular. It, and that is a little surprising. And and again, I, I wrote that uh, Paul George has been one of my favorite players because I do like the fact that he shows up at both ends of the court. If you look at the stats, he especially when you incorporate the on versus off some of the plus minus adjusted plus minus type of metrics. He shows up as being one of the best players in the league, especially. I mean, he still is now, but uh, he had some years where his team was like 17 points. This was with OKC in in 2019. 17 points per 100 possessions better with him on the court versus off. And again, Mm. some of that has to do with who your teammates are and who's coming off the bench for you. That's a big one. But even when you adjust that type uh, type of stuff away, which is what we did with uh, the stat known as Raptor, I wish I could remember the uh, fun acronym or no, I'm sorry. uh, The acronym that just happened to spell out Raptor because we, we didn't Mm. plan that on purpose. You have to keep the kayfabe going with that. (laughs) Uh, But if you, but if you uh, if you looked at Raptor, I mean, he showed up as being one of the best or maybe the uh, uh, in the conversation of the best two way players in the game uh, in in those years. And he still has retained a lot of that impact. And so I think that's why the stats love Paul George a lot more than if you looked at maybe something basic like a player efficiency rating where he was like just barely scraping like 19 or 20 in the past handful of years, never really had that big eye popping MVP, you know, kind of caliber season that if you look at some of the stuff that tries to isolate impact on his team, that's where he shines. And so I thought it was interesting to look at how, what that means for the Sixers, because I had been, earlier in the offseason looking at things through this prism of 
how much star power do you, does a team have and how much do they need to have in order to be a championship caliber team? And you can look at that by comparing the talent, whether you want to look at Raptor, whether you want to look at any stat, really, and compare that of their like first, uh, their number one best player, second best player, third best player to what typically is in the range of the first, second, and third best player on an NBA championship team. And traditionally speaking, you need to really check off uh, a f- at least two of those three boxes relative to the the average champion and typically it really probably needs to be like your number one needs to be in the high end of the range or above the the median you, you there's some negotiability around your number three but your no, if your number three is toward the low end then your number two needs to be toward the high end and ideally you would get three guys that would be in that range of like we've seen this type of team win before and when you look at those historically speaking nate silver did a did sort of was my inspiration for this when we worked at 538 together. He did uh, a piece that looked at how often the teams that have this certain amount of star power win the championship. And if you have players that fit that mold, three players that fit the mold of the championship, top three, big three, whatever you want to call it, you win at like a really, really high rate, at least like I want to say 50% of the time when you have players Mm. like that together. And so when you look at how the big three of this new Sixers team did last year, Embiid checks off the standard for a number one. Paul George checks off the standard for a number two. And Tyrese Maxey checks off the standard for a number three. So that's the good news for Philly. The bad news is I have not fully unpacked this uh, looking at recent years, but my hunch is that the relationship between the big three caliber or just star power in general and winning the championship has been greatly uh, reduced in mm. recent years. And it's part of the reason why we're in this historic stretch of we've seen six different champions in six years. That's only the second time that's ever happened in NBA history. And it's just maybe a different formula. And we've seen many of these teams try to build a big three along that paradigm and flame out pretty spectacularly, including this is the funniest part of all a team with Paul George as part of the big three uh, with the Clippers. So you can't fully say it's going to work for them, and I really want to see how it works for them because we do have this kind of counter evidence, and, and it's a case where if you build something around a sample that goes back a long time, I mean, the sample of looking at champions, I think we looked back to like 1977, which was, or 76, the first year after the ABA merger, it really works in history, but I think things are because of analytics, because of just the pace at which change is happening in all of these sports, things accelerate faster. And there comes to be a point in which the best practices over the course of decades maybe don't apply as strongly as they do to the present. Yeah, I I'm OK with all the parity as long as there's a strong correlation between best team that season and team that wins the championship. That's something that I find to be sorely lacking in your beloved baseball and your beloved hockey. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, no I, I don't like that. I don't like that. Just <laughs> Hockey's getting better. I mean, honestly, like, hockey has mm. gotten better in recent years. Like there was a time throughout the two thousands into the 2010s where you'd have some pretty random champions. Uh, and, and there had been a long time between, I want to say, the 97 and 98 Red Wings and then the 2015 and 16 or maybe 16 and 17 Penguins. Those were back-to-back champions. We didn't have one in between then because it just was kind of chaotic. Uh, And Mm -hmm. now I do feel like the past handful of years, we've seen the best team win more often, pretty much since COVID. Like COVID seemed to be a Mm -hmm. weird sort of reset point for the NHL in that regard. MLB is still like, you know, last year we had the, rangers and the diamondbacks like you know it's yeah. you can't you you can't predict it as well well what do you think of okay so i could take this in two different directions on whether you think that some players are chokers because that is what guy at the sports bar might say about paul george and here we don't judge him snootily like they might in a jj reddick podcast i go let's hear that guy out and actually now analyze situation so we could talk, get into are some players in some sports chokers or we could get it to uh is the nation of canada one big choker when it comes to hockey because has this been a 30 oh like, how God. long has the streak been it's been since 1991 years 31, 31 years. 31 year streak 
Now, I think there are seven teams currently from Canada, but that's gone up and down a little bit. Um, that seems to be one of the most insane streaks in sports. So which one do you want to look at? Uh, we can talk about Canada's Stanley Cup drought because it is highly improbable given just the teams that they've had, the amount of times they've come close this past Stanley Cup final was, I want to say, the uh, the fourth. I, I even wrote about this. I can't remember the exact number, but I, it's either the fourth or fifth straight game seven that they've lost in that in this stretch of years <laughs> oh uh, in which when they've made the finals, they've taken it to game seven far more often than non-Canadian Stanley Cup finals have gone seven. And yet they consistently lose these game sevens and you know you get a lot of great footage from vancouver from riots uh, when that oh, happens yeah. traditionally but it's it's really uh it, it's it boggles the mind some of it has to do with the fact that there was a period of time like pretty much right after the streak started so the 93 montreal canadians win the stanley cup with patrick waugh uh, you know they had just had this star studded cast and the economics of hockey change pretty much immediately after that, they get their first national U S TV deal with Fox two years after that. There's a lot of money coming into the game, but it's unevenly distributed between the Canadian and the U S side. And I think that played a role for at least before the 2005 lockout, because the payrolls for the Canadian teams just could not keep up with the payrolls for the American teams where you had, you know, the Red Wings and the Avalanche and the Flyers and uh, the Stars and teams like that, the Devils, they were just like loaded up on, on talent. And then the Canadian teams were like, well, we've got Ryan Smith is our best player on the Oilers. Shout out to Ryan Smith. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that played a role. Certainly the salary cap era is a little tougher to explain because that, really nerfed the ability of the American mm. teams and the big market teams to spend more. And so you would think that that would really provide the Canadian teams with an opportunity. And they made the final uh, uh, a number of times since then. And so maybe some of it is just really bad luck. And some of it is just they they, they were unable to kind of close the deal in these situations because they've had multiple times in which they were like up three, two playing game uh, six at home and they lose and then have to go back. Uh, in this particular case, it was almost a, uh, a consolation prize that it's like, hey, you guys should be happy that you're even playing a game seven because you went down mm. 3 0. But then it, it's really rough to come that far and dig yourself out yeah. of the hole almost uh, and then still hey, lose. Hey, man, I know nothing about hockey. I know that we are narrative creating machines. <laughs> I do like the idea that the less your area cares, has some sort of positive effect on whether you win a Stanley <laughs> Cup. I think it's very interesting. All these Sunbelt the sun these sun belt teams, yeah. they, they come through and the regions that really care, there's this anxiety in the rink. Is that what they call it? I don't know. Uh, it is, yeah. <laughs> well, certainly with the Leafs. I mean, I, I think a lot of it, I'm glad you brought that up because the Leafs alone probably account for like half of the, the, the drought. Just the Leafs failing consistently mm. to meet expectations based on the talent that they have. And then there's always a circular firing squad and recriminations over like, okay, what do we have to do this year will be different. And then they'll have optimism going into the next year's playoffs and then they'll lose again. And it's just this like cruel cycle that's been going on for a long time in Toronto. But you would think Toronto being the, the biggest market and the, probably of all the Canadian teams, the one that there is just the most media focus on them how they're doing and them doing well uh you would think that that would it does create that pressure cooker for good or for bad yeah. and it, maybe it's like a new york type of situation where it's like some players can hack it when they're on the yankees yeah. some can't you know yeah versus playing in florida in a city where people don't even know what city you're playing in i've, yeah. I've been there it's a long drive from miami to get to that particular arena uh maybe it's just the relaxation one needs to succeed at hockey who knows um do you think that certain players great players in your mind are chokers or because you're so analytically minded 
you look at it as this is bad luck or variance. Is there a player? I brought up Peyton Manning as, and I think it's complicated. I think Peyton Manning had those moments, but worked his way through it, right? I'm not just labeling somebody completely. I think that he had choked, but he worked his way through these things. But is there a player that comes to mind when I bring up chokers? Well, I think about A-Rod was famously sort of the the person that they brought up, and maybe this was just the juxtaposition against Jeter, but like A-Rod always choked in the playoffs and his stats were down and Jeter's stats went up during the playoffs. And, you know, you could kind of use that to blame A-Rod for the Yankees not winning World Series once he arrived. I, I of course, as a young reader of fire Joe Morgan and things like that was always like the first one, uh, to, to mm. charge, uh, you know, against the, the traditionalists and be like, this is just obvious bullshit. And you're kind of, you know, ascribing this narrative to something that's really just about, you know, noise and all that. You know, I think I've softened on a lot of things that were dogmatic about analytics early in you know the 2000s when we're when we're all young and filled with piss and vinegar as they say uh and i do think there are there are certainly demonstrably players that play better or worse in the playoffs if you account for everything and you have a large enough sample i think the sample size question is the really elephant in the room because most players don't have enough of a sample in the playoffs to even get to the point where you can make that determination. And there's a weird counterbalancing effect where in order to have enough of a sample in the playoffs, you actually have to be pretty good in order Mm. to kind of rack up enough uh, plate appearances or minutes or whatever metric, whatever sport we're talking about to even be able to analyze it. So I, I do think it's going to become more of a question for players because um, there's another sub stacker, Sam Miller. I'm sure many of the people in your audience have heard of him. He used to write for ESPN, great writer. And he had a uh, piece about how with the expansion of the playoffs in baseball, postseason numbers should take on more and more and more of a share of the attention Mm. that we give to a player's case for things like the Hall of Fame or just their greatness in general. And baseball always traditionally almost ignored the postseason, which was always kind of funny to me, like when talking about the Hall of Fame, like we look at regular season stats, we don't talk about the playoffs. And that made sense perhaps at the time, because for a long time, the postseason really just consisted of the World Series. And it really was not an expanded postseason, even to like the division series until 1995. But now we have a ton of rounds and a ton of games that you have to get through in order to win the World Series. And so we should start talking about that more. And I think that that's an opening to talk about all of the sports, because every sport either is going to expand its postseason, wants to expand its postseason, and it goes to what has been a theme on your podcast so often, which is this idea of inventory versus events. Mm. And uh, in the past, a lot of the regular season stats are compiled over the inventory, which makes sense in a previous era. But now as every sport pivots toward wanting to have these big attention-grabbing events, those are the postseason moments, and those are the ones that probably players should be judged on more often. And then we have more of a sample to be able to say who the chokers versus aren't are. Yeah. Football is the tricky one because it it's funny. I mean, Lamar Jackson through six playoff games, that is a small sample size, but it's also in football. That's an eternity. That's yeah, it's four like a half different decade post-season. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's four different postseason adventures and his stats are so bad they're so remarkably bad and i can come up with a narrative as to why i saw how the kansas city chiefs defended him and i don't think it's the way that would have happened in the regular season so he does get something extra thrown at him and that extra attention seems to have undermined but I again six games it's just six games so should that dramatically alter one's assessment of a two-time MVP I think it should but there's a fair argument that it shouldn't and that's a case where maybe you 
maybe you don't have a large sample for Lamar Jackson specifically, but we could look at like, hey, do rushing quarterbacks tend to not perform as well in the postseason? And I'm sure someone's done this research. I can't really think of uh, what its conclusion is, but I would not be surprised at all if that's an element of the game that gets taken away in the postseason. And then when you're Lamar Jackson, and that is like a huge part of the weapon that makes you as great as you are, it's naturally going to have an effect on your performance in the postseason. So I I think we can kind of get around the sample size question somewhat by just looking at like playing styles, which of course doesn't get to the fundamental question of the choker, which is like, do you have some <laughs> kind of psychological block or do you not have enough heart or whatever mm -hmm. the things that people used to attribute uh, the, the old crusty sports writers used to attribute these things to back in the day uh, before we became so enlightened and threw all so of that in the garbage. As we drank our wine and yes. really ruminated on the intricacies of sport, uh, ironically, JJ Reddick, bit of a playoff choker. Uh, <laughs> you know, you could go through the data. It's not, it's not flattering. I'm not trying to. <laughs> hey, in a very impressive career. I'm not trying to slight the entirety of the career. To have a double digit year career in the NBA is is quite impressive and he is an impressive podcaster as well but one of these guys where for whatever reason in the playoffs I mean you ask people give me your JJ Reddick playoff memories and he's been in quite a few postseasons but this is a digression as we end this podcast because I've got to run to pick up my kid from the summer camp but Neil you are a content beast man you're doing a great job uh what do you want to promote for us on the outro uh, you know, you, people can find me at neilpain.substack.com. I'm also writing at ESPN. I've been writing regularly at NASCAR.com. So I, I put, tend to kind of, uh, I, I don't use Twitter that much. I use Substack Notes because I'm just a, apparently a company man for Substack. But, you know, they're good people. And uh, yeah, you can find whenever I kind of blast out those links. And yeah, I just wanted to say again, thanks for having me on the show. And it's, uh, I just think it's interesting. We didn't talk about any of the cultural stuff that you usually do, which I just wanted to say for the longest time, you were the first and only sub stacker that I was a paid subscriber to. And ah. the reason why is because a lot of the stuff that you wrote around, you know, 2021, 2022, whether it was about COVID, whether it was just about the culture war stuff, it was unlike things that anyone else was willing to write or had the courage to write about at that time. Right. And so that is really what made me, you know, obviously I'd been reading you before that uh, with the Warriors and, and all of that, but that was to me like, okay, I want to support this guy's work. So it really is a joy to be on the show with you, but I wanted to get Aww. that off my chest before we got out today. That's very nice of you to say, Neil, and we can talk about all those topics next time. It's your fault for being so it is my fault. interesting in a sportsy, sportsy way uh, <laughs> that we were in that realm. But we can go anywhere and we'll have to do this again. This has been great. Uh, thanks so much, man. Thanks, Ethan.